um, in that uh, we've tried to make it, uh, it's clearly an internal event, it's part of the festival, but we want to share it with our global friends. Um, and w we did have a problem where we couldn't get visual stuff over to them. Anyway, the, the, the it's been sorted um, in that, uh, I, I don't think I need to tell you all this information actually, but uh, just be aware that it might be slightly higgledy piggledy over there, but uh, David's got it all sort of uh, controlled and, and the, main, the main focus is that we want, to pardon? <laughs> yeah, well anyway, the main focus is that we want to make this special to you and this is uh, David's show. Anyway, enough of all that technical stuff. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is when I get the signal from Ben that the live stream is working and all that sort of stuff, he will wave to me. I will first of all wave to you, Ben, to say that we're ready <laughs> and then... Um, then you wave to me, and then I start formally. And it is sort of like formal, because you know, I'm going on to the screen, as it were. You know, they, they're watching it on the telly. Um, and then uh, over to David and everything. Um, and you're, uh, uh, do you want to explain now about how the show's going, or do you want to wait until... When you start. When you start. You, you can do that. Fine. That's good. So I think we're... Ben, I, how, are, how are things going at your end? Okay. <laughs> Good. I think we're there. So let's just take a few deep breaths, as it were. I feel as I'm going to start to do a singing practice or something. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, everybody all fine now? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the festival. We are now into Tuesday, which is more or less halfway. We start on Friday evening, and then we had a wonderful weekend, a wonderful day yesterday. Um, but today is, and, to, and tomorrow actually, are two very special days when we're going to be very much exploring the mining history and all the connections with it. And we are so fortunate to have uh, Dr. David Amos. Um, and David not only is giving the talk this morning, but he's been a major part of the whole way we've been putting together this festival. And uh, exhibitions and y you name it, David's been right there doing it. He is our mining expert, and there's no doubt about that. So uh, I'm going to basically stop talking now and let David take over. Uh, and um, let's give a, a round of applause anyway for David. Right. Um, you can all hear me, yeah? You can all see the screen. I often think when, uh, when you get introduced as an expert, Alan, I once got told a definition for an expert, an X is an has-been, and a spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> right, the, the talk today will be um, probably about an hour, so because we, we're slightly a bit later than starting time, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So I'm, I'm expecting uh, I'll finish by about quarter past 11, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session uh, following that, and then after that we'll go back through there and there'll be, be coffee and biscuits and tea and that until about 12 o'clock, all right. And uh, the, the talk actually, it starts, uh, it's in various parts. I've, I've just rejigged it actually this last week. Um, so the first bit will tell you a bit about the development of coal mining in Nottinghamshire and how Eastwood fits into that. And then we'll look at the, the Eastwood bit of that with the predominance of Barber Walker Company because you're just off Walker Street here on, on Percy Street, so that's the Barber Walker was the coal company. And then a bit particularly about Brinsley Colliery, which is, the, which is very prominent in the Lawrence connection, where Lawrence's dad worked and some of his, uh, the other Lawrence family at that. Uh, and then I'll finish off, basically, just a bit of food for thought about where we're going or what possibly might happen regarding coal heritage and Lawrence heritage and that with Eastwood with various initiatives, what's going off, and now we look at that going in this uh, post-coal era, bearing in mind 
food for thought, we're fastly approaching when it's 40 years since the last Eastwood pits or the last deep mining round here, which was up at Moor Green up the road and uh, up at Boyle at Underwood. Um, so obviously, you know, it's getting a long time reflecting that mining generation, which we had is coming to an end along with the memories and that. So this is where yesterday I had a meeting about, you know, the significance of, of gathering those memories and that, why people still here. Right. So um, that map you can see there, the, um, to the left side of that, the dotted area, that's the uh, exposed coal field. You can see Eastwood down towards the left-hand corner there. That's where your oldest workings were. Um, so on, on the southern bit of that, the area Wash Valley, and then it goes, it more or less goes in a line from Woolerton right up to Chesterfield. And um, some of your earliest workings go right back to the 14th century on that exposed coal field. And then you had a move, particularly from the Industrial Revolution, uh, you moved where you see just to the side of Eastwood there, the River Lean, that's where you had the older concealed coal fields. So you, your actual coal seams dip to the east in Nottinghamshire and, and, and they carry on right through, uh, well, more or less right through to Skegness if you want. But obviously there's the issue of ventilation and pumping water. Um, so particularly the older coal field there, you had places like Annersley, Upnall uh, and Besswood, which were all developed in the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, and then the next bit of development was northeast of Mansfield, that was a 20th century coal field. So that became known as the Dukeries. And that's where the last coal mine closed just over seven years ago, where Anthony, who sits here, Anthony worked there, was, uh, I think you were the last Eastwood miner, aren't you, Anthony? As far as I'm aware. So Anthony started out around Eastwood, went to Calverton, uh, which was an NCB sink, and then up to Thorsby. So uh, the Dukeris Coalfield, that's where you had Edwin Stowe, Rufford, Lidworth, all villages like that. They were all developed between 1902, 1904 and about 1928. And the prominent company there was the Bolsover Colliery Company, which was a Derbyshire company. And then the, the very last bit of the equation was uh, you got Calverton there and just south of the Trent you also had Cockgrave and north of Ollerton you had Bevercoats. They were all NCB sinkings. In the, in the 1950s and 60s. So that's how it developed basically, the coal field over, over several centuries. So you can see Eastwood's position there. I often say Eastwood, I made a, uh, a quote in, uh, they asked for a quote in the festival, which I think you did, Alan, and I says, I always see Eastwood as a spiritual home of, of, of coal mining heritage and arts and literature and everything in Eastwood. You've got the literary contacts. It's on the old part of the coal field. You've got workings that go back centuries and that. So literally where you are now, it's all roots and everything get lying coal. So I mentioned there, that's, if you look there at Nuttall, this is a cross section of your coal. That black line you can see there, there's about 20 coal seams in that, what were mined. The most important one was the top hard seam. So most of the prominent pits, certainly from the 1860s onwards, 1850s, were sunk to the top hard. Uh, and you can see as it goes over to Cockgrave there, uh, when, they, when they sunk the Cockgrave shafts in the late 50s, there was a lot deeper than you got old pits around Nuttall and Kimberley. So, you know, the old issue then, you got more problems with mine ventilation uh, and, and obviously pumping and what have you. But that, that's how your coal basically goes. It, it, a number of fault lines, but it basically dips to the east and carries on there. And that's, uh, that was a rising star. Where's Jim, Stur uh, Jim Diamond? Uh, you know, that, that's a, one of your rising Kimberley stars, Roger Grimes. Um, that that's shows you on the, the see, you see just to the right of Roger there, you can see that coal seam. That's uh, just below the Royal Oak on the B600 where the, the houses were built. So we took them pictures probably 15 years ago now. And uh, the, the, uh, interestingly, they let us go on as a historical society to go and map the place when they were actually doing, uh, build it, prior to building the houses. And these were the type of pits. Uh, you're talking the old uh, shonky pits and that. Certainly by the late 18th century, early 19th century, these type of pits were developed all around north of Eastwood and on the outcrop. 
This, this one you see there is Portland Colliery. So that's your old Watnall Colliery and that one's Portland. And um, I'll just put that down. Uh, in Smith's uh, early coal mining around Nottingham, which he was an academic at Nottingham University in the late 80s, um, he found the lease for the, the earliest lease for coal mining, which was in the Middleton manuscripts, which is, the, they, they were, um, the Middletons were the nobility at Woolerton Hall, the Willoughby family. Earliest copy of the lease of a coal mine is from Nottinghamshire, and it's found in the Middleton manuscripts. The lease, which is dated 1316, concerns a mine in the Cossel area, of the exposed coalfield projecting towards Nottingham on which the great expansion of mining in the 16th and 17th century would take place. Well, he's talking there about Woolerton and Tralmore and Strelly. Uh, by the lease, Richard de Willoughby, demise to Adam, the son of Nicholas, and to eight other men at Cossel, is mine of what they called then sea coal uh, in a field called Le Levitostop. Adam and his fellows were paid 12 pence a week for each pickaxe employed. So that's your earliest record of coal mining, and that would come to an end literally one year short to 700 years when Antony finished at Thorsby seven years ago. So a lot of your real early workings were this type of working, bell pit working. That's why you've got littered with shafts on that old exposed coal field. And of course, they didn't have records till 1850. So a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the actual maps you see from the old survey office, they are guesstimates about where the shafts will actually be. And occasionally you, you will hear a story where a swilly appears and suddenly one of these shafts appears somewhere. You know, and you'll see this on, in the past, it roll on the newspaper. Amazing, the shafts appear. So, oh, yeah, amazing. There's only several thousand, like, you know. So all these shafts were suddenly abandoned and that, and they didn't fill them in like they did later on. So the, this were bell pit working. That's, the, that's Smith's book, The Early Mining in Nottinghamshire, which covers that area around Woolerton. Uh, and Woolerton Hall, by the way, was built on the profits of coal. So we had a significant coal mining industry in its day in Tudor times at Woolerton. Nothing like later, don't think about later production, which was obviously mass production in millions of tonnes. Uh, but he had a significant coal mine in, uh, in that period. Now that you see there, that's, if you ever look at any maps from the survey office, you can see those little dots, they sort of squares with a uh, round, round circles with a, a square in it, a, a plus sign. So look to that bottom left hand corner, that's all Ikea and all round there, Giltbrook. And you follow it up to where it says more green, and then to the left, to the left-hand corner up there, that's north of Brinsley. And that's all your shafts. What, uh, well, I say, that is the shafts, what they know about. There's a damn sight more they don't know about. And uh, that's typical, if you follow that art crop, right from Woolerton up to Chesterfield, that's a typical cross-section you'll get of that. So uh, lots and lots of coal mining. Um, Certainly north of Brinsley, before the Brinsley pit we're going to get to later. And then later, look, there. So that's north of Eastwood. So you can see there's some of these, these pits, like your Bowvale ones, Jobs Pit, Bowvale number one. These are pits from the early 19th century and through possibly into the 18th century when they were mining. What, what they refer to is the term is shonky pits, which we often say is the, the smaller pits. They sometimes say the name comes from the beam engine, what used to pump, like a Newcomen engine, which was a shonky. That's, that's one of the theories about it. So lots, lots and lots of shafts. And these, they often call them whim gyms or horse gyms. This was the one that used to be at Woolerton Hall. And um, this is the ones that Lawrence describes um, in his paper, Nottinghamshire and the Mining Countryside. The string of coal mines of Barber Walker and Co. had been opened some 60 years before I was born, and Eastwood had come into being as a consequence. And he described them as bits of mines, footrail mines with an opening in the hillside, which we normally call mining addict mines or drift mining, which miners walked into, or windless mines where the miners were wound up one at a time in a bucket by a donkey. 
The windless mines were still working when my father was a boy and the shafts of sun were still there when I was a boy. Well, I, I think it's, it's certainly got that right to an extent where I would certainly say, I mean, bear in mind Lawrence was born 1885, so he's talking about 1825. Some of these pits would predate that, definitely. They would go back to the 18th century and possibly before that. By the way, that, uh, the one I showed you, that windless one, I'll just flick back to it, that is now not at Woolerton, it's uh, the Lancashire Mining Museum, which ironically uh, was on the television this morning. I don't know if you saw BBC News about 7 o'clock, but they, they was reported live from the Lancashire Mining Museum at Astle Park at, uh, to, to, to the west of Manchester, and that's where this is going to be re-erected. Now, the Employment Commissions Act... Uh, this is where the commissioner for this area, there was a royal commission looking at women and children employed into coal mining. And the, the act went through in 1842. The actual legislation banned women from working underground and children under 10. But the actual report was done the year before in 1841. Round here it was a Mr. Fellows who did the report and he did cover the early Barber Walker pits. And, and, and the other smaller pits around that, uh, around that area. So if you look there, this is what we did in a, we, we did a course on coal mining around Eastwood. It must be getting on for nearly 20 years ago now down at Durban House. And, and we actually broke down the figures. Uh, so if you can see there, Eastwood, Beggar Lee, Watnall, Barber Walker, there were 12 shafts. So bear in mind, this is 1841. There was 104 under 13s working at those pits and 138 which were between 13 and 18. Interestingly though, if you look on the right hand columns there, there's only two women employed at Ena and Newlands. So the women issue wasn't around here so much, it was in the Scottish coal fields, particularly parts of Yorkshire and Lancashire. And some of those, um, the women after this legislation it basically took another 120 years because the last ones in Lancashire became what they called pit brow girls and they worked on the screens cleaning coal and that. The last one of them were employed in the 1960s, believe it or not. This was in the Lancashire on the pit screens. So, uh, but I'll, I'll read you a quick account of the... This is the commission done by Mr. Fellows. So, Eastwood, there was a George Hodgkinson... Uh, He's 11 years old, he's worked for Barber Walker Pits for three years, mends the roads, which is the old roadways, has one, and one shilling and uh, twopence a day, goes down at 6.30am till 6.30pm, so 12 hour shifts, 20 minutes allowed for dinner time, which would be a snap. Last year he used to drive between, which we think would be ganging ponies, he has one and a half miles to walk to the pit and then one and a half miles back home again at the end. Goes to the Methodist Sunday School at Hilltop, has been there for four years, reads the testament and can write a little. So bear in mind then that the education was just Sunday schools. So that's a, that's a report from, that's number 98, George Hodgkinson in the Children's Commission report for Eastwood. Right, coming on to the Eastwood area, the second bit now, that's Lamb Close House. So that features, of course, that was the home of the Barber family. So you've, you've got your, your two families, Barber Walker. Uh, that featured in Lawrence's work in Women in Love as Shortlands. So where, if you've read Women in Love or seen the, you've seen the film where uh, the, it's based there and Gerald Crite, who was the son of the, the old miner and that, he's, he's based, this is the coal owner's the traditional families that became coal owners, of course, because they had the mineral rights underneath their land. So traditionally, a lot of these uh, made their money from the mineral rights. So still, still all there. I think Lady Barber, Andrew, is she 100 and... It's about, she's still alive, I think. Is she, Andrew, is she 101, 100 and 100? Something like that. Yeah, so she's still actually alive, Lady Barber. Uh, so that, that overlooks Small Green Reservoir, that, that one, if you go up there. Then the other half of the uh, company, of course, was the Walker family at Eastwood Hall. And that's got a long history to involved in coal from when it was built in the 1830s right through until 1994 when it was the headquarters for British Coal Corporation. 
So very, very long history. And if you do look on our Mining Heritage website, uh, I think during the lockdown, the coronavirus lockdown, uh, Carolyn at the museum was, was interested in putting a link between, which is now, this is now Ailey Conference Centre. And so I did do a blog, um, a quite lengthy blog, uh, on our Mining Heritage website. So if you go on that, there's one about Eastwood Hall and the Walker family. Um, they did end up living down at uh, near Brockenhurst in Hampshire, which was the, they became she, the, the late, she, they became the Mo, Mo, Walker Munros or the Munro Walkers down there. So they built they, they built in a quite it's a quite splendid place now down there. Uh, one of these high, uh, highfalutin hotels and that called Rhineland, and that's where they ended up. So all their profits of coal from right here ended up at Brockenhurst in Hampshire. So the pits, um, the, the early pits and that, come the 1860s, uh, Barbara Walker started its first significant expansion of, of what would be the larger pits sinking, which were to last the next sort of 80 to 120 years and that, round Eastwood. And uh, it, prominent with that, that was High Park Colliery, so that was up in the, uh, up in the woods there. This was about 1860. Um, Colin Griffin, who's a retired coal mining academic, used to be at Trent, uh, he did a paper on this in the Thoroton Transactions where he describes it as the development of a super pit in 1860 at High Park. Uh, your next one, more green. So that were 1865. So that was Eastwood's last pit. That shut in 1985. That, that was the Minton pit in Sons and Lovers. Uh, Watnell was up uh, further to the east up there, or, or more technically, New Watnell. The old Watnall one was beyond, below the Royal Oak. New Watnall was further up, uh, but beyond where the side of the motorway, where the brickyard used to be. I don't know if some of you remember that. Where the chimneys used to be, that was Watnall Colliery. Uh, and then you had Selston, which was Selston Underwood Colliery, which became pile number one, which you know well, Jim, of course. Uh, and that, that was at 1875 sinking up there. But more prominently, of course, is Brinsley, they redeveloped that in 1872 from the early Brinsley pit. Uh, so it, again, they put the tandem edge stocks and redeveloped it all. And this was all the major redevelopment in the 1860s, early 1870s around Eastwood. So the, you're talking now about the foundations, not with shonky pits, with a few couple of hundred or hundred men in. You're talking about several hundred, 500 workforce going up to a thousand. So it's the big pits. What were the foundations of what were to last to the, really to the 1980s? Now this were interesting. This map uh, cropped up probably in the last 10 years. This is uh, a royalties map. So I mentioned the royalties, what the coal owners get. So you have to map it all out then uh, to where their pits are. And under that land, they get so much a ton for every ton of coal that came out. So it was a nice earner for them until 1938 when that finished. And then obviously the politics entered uh, after the Second World War altered and you had the nationalised industry. So prior to 1938, these coal owners earned a nicely principal sum for every single ton of coal that came up on their land. So you can see them pits I mentioned to you there. Look, Selston, Brinsley, High Park, Moor Green, Watnall. And then below that, you've got the Digby Company, which is at Gilt Brook. And uh, Digby, you've got Newthorpe, New London, Digby Country, and Speedwell at Kimberley. Uh, and they later, the, new, the Digby Company later developed Gedling Colliery, which was east of Nottingham, which become known eventually in the 1950s onwards and that as the Pit of Nations because there was more nationalities worked at Gedlin than any pit in Britain. And if you go to Gedlin Country Park now, and then go to the cafe there, there's an 1899 cafe and, and sort of visitor centre. There's, um, there's a, an actual mural, what they've done on the side there for Gedlin, which says 1899 to 1991. And it's surrounded, it says the pit of nations in the middle, a picture of the pit, and there's 30 flags around it of nationalities that worked at Gedlin Pit. So that's all the different people we had worked there. So uh, Barber Walker, cr it created a railway between its Eastwood collieries, the Barber Walker Standard Gauge Railway uh, to link all its pits up to take the coal obviously down to the sidings at Langley Mill or at the other end at, at the Kimberley Nuttall end. So that's one of your Barber Walker locos. 
typically described at the start of Old Rue Chrysanthemums, Andrew, when it's coming down, which you'll get later tonight, those of you that are coming. Andrew, uh, Malcolm Gray is going to talk about that, uh, the, the, the short story tonight. So it starts with number four engine came down from Selston. So this is your typical pit engine. Th that's one on the section between uh, High Park and Watnall in the 1950s. And then you've got a bit of the old line there. This is the last bit which we used down from Moor Green, which is on the lane leading up to Connie Gray Farm. So if you're seeing that in the, the front of that there, you can still see some of the uh, sleepers in the foreground, which is still there. So bear in mind, that's not been used for a long, long time, but you've got a bit of track bed there. And uh, this is... That's how the, the, the yellow line there is the Barber Walker Railway. So you can see on the left how it connected up with the Midland Railway at Langley Mill off of Cromford Road. And the Great Northern Lines, the great green one. And then at the other end, the right, bottom right hand corner is where it connected up at the Nuttall end, again with both lines. So you see how that connected up with the lines. Well, Lawrence describes this in... Um, I'll just get my paper here. He describes it in Sons and Lovers. From Nuttall, high up on the sandstone amongst the wood, the railway ran past the ruined priory of the Carthusians. That's Bowvale Priory is on about. And past Robin Hood's well, then down to Spinney Park. So Spinney Park is High Park Colliery. So you can see which way it's coming up, map. And then on to Minton. Well, Minton was more green colour, as I mentioned, a large mine amongst the coal fields. Then from Minton across the farmlands to the valley side of Bunkers Hill. Bunkers Hill is where the lines join. So we see where it says Barber and Walker on the yellow bit, where them lines join at Nether Green. That was the junction. Uh, then it branched, branched off from there and ran north to Beggar Lee. So in, in Sons and Lovers, Beggar Lee is Brinsley. And Selby, which is Selston Colliery, which became pile number one in the late 60s. And he describes them as six mines like black studs on the countryside, linked by a loop of fine chain, the railway. And that's in the early part of Sons and Lovers, the description of the railway. Right. Barber Walker then ventured off into South Yorkshire or on the South Yorkshire borders. So a significant pit they developed was at Bentley, north of Doncaster, in 1908. This is a book you can get from the National Coal Mining Museum, which will add a, a little potted history about Bentley Colliery. Bentley didn't shut till 1993. Uh, the other one was at Aworth, which is right on the Nottinghamshire, South Yorkshire border. And that's quite an interesting history because initially, uh, the book you can see there on the right, we did a project during the World War I commemorations because initially, prior to Barbara Walker taking over the development of the pit, it was going to be a German pit at Aworth in Nottinghamshire, an Anglo-German firm. So they started the company there in 1913, started the development of the pit at Aworth, and then all the workers got interned, the sinkers, when war broke out in 1914. And hence, they, they, they stopped the company. It was an Anglo-German company. They stopped that, and then out of our, uh, eventually out of that, when it all got wound up and that, in 1919, Barber Walker took over the development of the pit and started it as a production unit in 1924. So they're developing up in... The, in these are really big pits that they're going to uh, in the north of the county and in South Yorkshire. You can see this is from the 1935 uh, Colliery Yearbook. And if you look at that, interestingly, interesting people involved with um, Barber Walker. You see Major Thomas Philip Barber, Lamb Close House. The other person, of course, prior to that was a Robert Harrison, who was quite prominent. No relation to Andrew Harrison, by the way. But uh, two prominent people was Robert Harrison and Major, Major Barber. Uh, and interestingly there, you'll see who the secretary is for Barber Walker, is a George Chatterley. So you can see where Lawrence started getting his names from, can't you? Uh, and if you look, if I mention there about your pits, you've got your list of your pits there, but look at that manpower, Bentley. Bear in mind, this is 1935. So you've got uh, Brinsley's just employing 380 underground and 28 above ground. Bentley, 
underground, 2,954 and 475 on surface. So he's talking massive pits. These are real, you know, compared... There's more people nearly at Bentley uh, and Aworth than working at all the Eastwood pits combined in 1935. And uh, this, these were the, like, the coal yearbook became the um, guide to the coal fields when it was nationalised. And these were the yellow pages for the coal industry. So if you go down, it, when you research now into companies, pre-1947, it's the guide to the coal fields, what you need. Post-1947 onwards, it's, it's uh, got, uh, sorry, it's the colliery yearbook, pre-47, guide to the coal fields, uh, post-47. And it tells you, it's interesting because... These books, when the, in, the coal industry nationalised in 1947, there was 800 companies went to form the National Coal Board. 800 different companies right throughout Britain, and Barber Walker was one of them. That's a, a Barber Walker Watty, uh, which somebody found actually, they found that like they normally do, digging an allotment about 20 years ago. And suddenly find one and you find all these motties all up. These were the tags what they used to go for going down the pit as a safety tag. So that in the in the event you had two motties, you'd give them to the banksmen at the top, they go back to time and wages, and you had them on a check system and that. So in the event that you had a, an incident or an explosion underground, you knew exactly what men were in that section of the pit. And uh, to the extent where one chap at Kirkby, who's still there, Eric Brown, in time and wages, who's now about 82. Uh, he still remembers everybody at Kirkby by the check number. So if I'm going round Morrison's, it not be, it, I'll, I'll be coming to check out at Morrison's and go, I ain't going on 143, are you all right? And he knows everybody's check number because he's got this vision memory. And that's uh, a 1910 price list for Barber Walker Coal. So you'd like to buy some of that, wouldn't you? That's, that's cheaper than your gas bills, isn't it? <laughs> Coming up. So you can see there's different coal there from the different pits because you've got different graded coal. And uh, they have to, a lot of the time, your different coal, it had different burning qualities and that. Sometimes you have to mix it in that. And so we had, you know, particularly on there, look, bright cobbles and that. Because I know where you worked, Anthony, last off, when you were at Calverton, that used to supply the concessionary fuel. Calverton doubles, didn't it, last off in the 90s and 80s. So, uh, yeah, so that's a land, a land sale. They did actually used to be a land sale up at uh, Dovecot Road on there from the Barber Walker Railway. There was a little branch came up for a land sale for selling coal. And the history of Barber Walker, this is uh, 250 years in coal, was written by this chap who was a surveyor, uh, George Whitelock. And uh, the, he wrote the book, it was produced in 1956, published. It, was, it took from 1947 the 1954 for the Barber Walker Company to get its assets all together while it was owed for compensation from the coal board. So it took all them time. And then the last job, what um, uh, they did was getting George Whitelock the job of writing the company history. Uh, if you get one of them books and you do a little search on a books or any of these old rare book things, it'll set you back a tidy 400 quid. Although I have got one at home and I didn't pay 400 quid for it. But most of them, were, you, it, they, they're very, very rare and it's the history of the company. So we get back to Eastwood now, the development of, the, of a mining town really, particularly in the late Victorian period. Uh, with, with the development of those mines, I told you, Moor Green, High Park and that, Eastwood, developed in that time into what we know as a mining town or a mining uh, a company town. So not, that's Nottingham Road you see now, and then you can see that disappear. Look, you'll see uh, the eastward of Lawrence's time come into being. There, right? So that's, that's about Edwardian, probably Edwardian World War I time, because you've got the tram tracks in the middle. That's when the, the famous Ripley Rattlers which ran from 1913 to 1932. So Eastwood developed, started developing significant population by about 5,000 by 1901. And these were the, the pit houses they built. These were the new buildings, all the squares, which are just down from the museum and around that area, Princess Street and that. 
Uh, these are the, the tied cottages, what they built, miners' houses, which a lot of companies built. Uh, eventually ended up as NCB houses, of course, after nationalisation. The NCB incorporated in Britain 150,000 houses. Uh, some of them are for sale. I originate from Annersley, which is about six miles to north of here, and I've been told some of them are for sale in village now at 150k. I bought mine off the National Coal Board 40 years ago for 2,750. So I ought to start, I ought to kept on to it, didn't I, really? Didn't <laughs> but, uh, these are described um, as, again, going back to Nottinghamshire and the mining countryside, Lawrence's 1929 paper. Uh, these are described as the company erected what is still known as the new buildings or the squares. These new buildings consist of two great olive squares of dwellings right down on the rough side of the hill, little four-room houses with the front looking outwards into the grim blank street and the back with a tiny square brick yard, a long brick wall, WC and an ash pit. So he's describing all that area now. The squares, of course, got knocked down in the 1970s, but Princess Street and the streets around it, the old pit houses still exist there. That's Princess Street earlier this year. So typical terraced pit housing, um, which, which you got is typical of that time. Uh, villages like Newstead, Annersley, where I came from, all around there, you've got these old terraced pit houses, which date from the 1860s, 1870s. Of course, the standard joke about that is what they used to tell some of these academics is these, the, the, these has got the uh, history of having the fastest form of communication ever known to mankind. And how it used to work is, on that left-hand side, there a chap used to come called the Rent Man. And the word got through to that one up farthest end, faster than lightning can travel. So they used to bang them on single brick on wall, they'd bang on wall and call it Poker Row. So all this system used to go through when either police or particularly Rent Man or somebody like that who they didn't want, they got this form of communication. Beat, it, beat any social media, hands down. But, uh, now that, uh, that book's just come out, it covers, not, don't cover Eastwood so much, but they've done it as part of the Mine It's a Major project. And young Chris Matthews, uh, it came to our house uh, back end of last year to finish this book off. And it covers the Sherwood Forest catchment area, so it's a wonderful book that gives you the development of pit housing in the Nottinghamshire coalfield. Because he's, he's, uh, Chris is an academic, he's an, he covers the history of housing and architecture. Uh, so they've done these little guides at the side, you can see. They're, they're the guides around the village. And uh, as late as yesterday, I did meet the minor to major people up at Edwinstow and suggested to them that a, si and a company book to this, you need to do the social history attached to it, the people, and they've agreed to that. So we've got some funding to match this book up to do the history of the people, the social history. So all your, your brass bands... Uh, your male voice choirs, your sports, your miners' welfares, your whippet racing and pigeons and all that. We're going to do the sister book to this one this next year. And I, uh, if you want any of these books, I'll be leaving some at the museum, along with the, another book we've got, which I'll get to later. So, uh, again, uh, in uh, this re again, another paper from University of Nottingham in the 90s, uh, which Moore did. Uh, they did these occasional papers which used to come from the uh, adult education section, which I believe, Andrew, they're doing some exhibition about the centenary of it, I think now, aren't they? Uh, so that's where I first started academia. The, Dennis, you went there, didn't you, Dennis, to the local history MA, was it, what they did? So w there's certain people in here that started that, that adult, used to be the cherry tree buildings, didn't it, Dennis? And uh, he used to start there. When I started me road on to academia, it was at night school when I was still working at the pit. So I was there in the early 90s and that, and used to d d work the shift and that. And then every Wednesday for two years, you'd do six o'clock till nine o'clock. And then every third week, I got me straight back on to nights and swapped somebody on afters in between so I could do this two-year course. And of course, you know what pit lads were like. They'd be all there now. Uh, they get back to the pit on nights. I gone on tonight. Did you get a detention? I says no. I says did you did, did you get a star? I says I'll tell you something. Somewhere on this golf face will be seeing stars in a minute. And, and that's all. They're all continually leg pulling all the time. But um, 
well, it, it described uh, Eastwood in this, interestingly. The predominant organisation was Colliery Company of Barber Walker. Indeed, the economic predominance was so complete that it would be perfectly in order to call Eastwood a company town, or perhaps more accurately, a company village. So you've got that issue then about um, we, we have got paternalistic owners and this fits in, of course, with all the history of the mining unions and labour history. So we had certain areas what were moderate and then the militant bits and that's the history of the labour history part, what came in no uncertain terms to an abrupt clash in 1984 because that was a clash of cultures in different areas. And it's to do with all this predominance of... Barber Walker and our, our relationships built up between workers and management and all that. So it's got a long, long history to do with it. And of course, Lawrence talks about this a lot. Um, I was just reading the other day, Andrew, returned to Bestwood. It was here at the time, the 1926 strike was breaking about September time. And Lawrence describes in that the clean ones and the dirty ones, which is people going to work and people that still holding out. And this was the time in September 26 when the strike, the, tw the 26 strike, were breaking, you know, at the time it was breaking in the Nottinghamshire coalfield. So, yeah, so it's interesting that uh, this, this is an occasional paper which they did at university and came out several ones which they used to produce uh, from, from the history department there. And then uh, this is the breach, of course, though, so they date again pit housing, which again Lawrence describes. Um, it's, it's like blank dominoes on, in blocks on six and that, if you look at the map. This is an earlier map. Of course, you can see the prominence of the tip at, uh, to Brinsley there, the more green tip in the background. That's taken off from Walker Street. Uh, this is a clip we did, Requiem for Coal, uh, when Thor's Bishop we did a, a ser series of clips on YouTube and that, doing a Requiem for Knott's Coal. Uh, can you play this one, Ben? On, see if you can play it on. And then it just describes, this is the description in Sons and Lovers of the breach in the bottoms. It's the description. I think most of you's read it anyway. It's the bit on the very first bit of Sons and Lovers where it describes the bottoms and that and the ash pits and that in the garden and that where they moved to, where the Lawrence has got the end house. So that's the, that's the breach house now there. So this was the Lawrence's second house, which was uh, a pit house. The, initially, the museum where it was born, uh, traditionally, that Robert Harrison I mentioned, who was prominent in the Barber Walker, he, he was prominent in, in the building of that house. Uh, but yeah, certainly, I, I always say to people, with no disrespect to the museum, the more accurate to, to me of a pit house is the breach. If you go there, the parlour's right. It's a little little parlour and, and the kitchen and that. And, it, and of course, these memories with, with ranges at back, I mean, I've got them from a kid in Ansley Rose. Not so much the black leaded range, it was a Yorkist model, where all the family used to be in that back, back place. Nobody ever went in parlour. Everybody were all in there. And, and bear in mind, <coughs> I mean, I'm from a big family. The, the, my last uncle, we, uh, um, he, he died. we had his funeral uh, on my dad's side. My last uncle was last Tuesday. But my dad was out of 10. And I've got 26 other cousins. So our missus completely refuses to go shopping anywhere near Sutton or Kirkby. Because it ends up being a four-hour job. Because we've got these massive families. And my granddad before that were out of 10. So you've just got these massive mining families who you know, uh, lived in these sort of houses. Uh, and that's, uh, some, of it, some might remember this society, that's Ron Fouts. Because um, the, bre the breach house is open this Saturday for part of the Heritage Open Days. And that's, I used to go down, I mean, that, that's about 15 years or so ago. I used to go down with Ron and we'd have a chat and open up the breach house for people to, to come and have a, a look round. And of course, some of the other things, this was uh, Beggar Lee Baths. So they had, they had what you'd know as a Lido. Uh, and interestingly, um, I mean, it's all gone now. You can still find a few tiles at the bottom of Mill Road. Uh, you can't really see where it was, but it, it was for miners and that. Bear in mind, you've got no uh, inside, you know, you've got the tin bath system and all that operating. Miners having strip washes like they do in the miner at home, Andrew, that sort of thing. Uh, so miners, when it got to the spring, would go here. And you still hear stories now, because there was one down at Langley as well, where 
when it come to the spring and it just got warm enough to start going to bathe in the Lydells, the first job they had was clearing all frogs out on it. And you lay that down at Beggar Lee down here, who at Bathsworth and at Langley and that. So these people that's now getting on into the 80s will tell you these stories about cleaning frogs out of a Lido. And uh, there used to be an old railway carriages there, what they used to change in, these old uh, dilapid railway carriages. That's the old miners' welfare, which is now the snooker club at the t at t opposite the miners' arms. So it's near the Sun Inn. So that was, uh, that was where the reading room, where Jesse Chambers and Lawrence used to go. So the institute started, uh, initially they set up reading rooms in institutes and that's where you'll find where Lawrence, Jesse Chambers went. And then 1920, you got your first welfare act for miners' welfares. 1952, that became CISWOL, which was the Coal Industry Social Welfare Organisation. And this is all the welfare side of, of the, where you had your bowling clubs, your pigeon clubs, uh, fishing clubs and everything, all the social side of coal mining. And, you, you know, I mean, you, all of you have seen brassed off of, Films like that, haven't you? And Billy Elliot and all that. So all that, so particularly brass stuff. You had brass bands and male voice choirs and all this wonderful talent. I mean, looking back now, and Kath will tell you this definitely, there were people at the pit with that much talent. I don't know how, how they were working at pits because they could. They were musicians and poets, and and they could do everything, artists and poetry, you know. And yet they were working in a pit. And, and all that wonderful stuff now, we save that, it reflects that life of, of, of a mining community and that. So that's why we put, last year, we put the book together, Coal in the Blood, the Coal Mining Anthology, me and Natalie, which reflected that life in a mining community and the work process and everything which we did. And, and we've had some good, good reviews from that book. Uh, and that's Durban House, uh, which the history of that, of course, 1872, there was a Coal Mines Act we had to have a manager then and appointed surveyor and started paying people. So they couldn't run it literally. You know, you got to have a, de a designated area for all your plans and paying people out and that. And that's the history of Durban House. Eventually, of course, it became flats and then it went into the Heritage Centre, which closed about six years ago. And they're currently trying to restore that from some community initiative, which is going off at the moment. So, right, on to Brinsley now. Of course, you've got the, the uh, particularly Brinsley is, is, is particularly linked with the Lawrence family. Um, and, and you go back really to uh, Quarry Cottage. So, John Lawrence, who was the, the grandfather, the father of Arthur Lawrence, settled here. Um, initially, Lawrence describes it as, as this being from the south of England, but I believe it was from Birmingham somewhere, Andrew, wasn't he? In, in, the, in the industrial quarters of Birmingham. So anyway, John Lawrence, he, he settled there, and of course the four sons they had all ended up working in the pit. Arthur Lawrence significantly was the, the, the father of D.H. Lawrence, who became the butty. Uh, and then James Lawrence, who we'll get to shortly, but Malcolm will touch on that tonight, he was killed at Brinsley Pit. And that's the story of what ended up being the old chrysanthemums. Uh, and Walter Lawrence was the one who killed his son, wasn't he, Andrew, was it? Did he have that altercation with his son at Ilkeston? And ended up killing his son, didn't he? But um, Quarry Cottage, again going back to mining countryside, Lawrence describes it. My grandfather settled in an old cottage down in a quarry bed at the brook at Old Brinsley near the pit. A young man trained to be a tailor, so he was the tailor for Barbara Walker, drifting from the south of England and got the job of company tailor for the Brinsley mine. So that's the time when uh, traditionally, if you do go to the breach this weekend, you will see a pair of moleskin trousers. And, the, and the, so they used to wear these particular clothes, what were hard-wearing clothes to work in the pit. Now, that's got an old history itself, pit clothes, or togs as we call them, pit togs. They'll tell you about women that had to, had to wash all these pit clothes and that, and it were like pit slurry in the, in the poncho. Uh, and that all ended, ironically, in 1979, where we ended up with a pit wear scheme, and that raw bright orange. So we all got tangled. So I can remember them, Jim and you and Anthony, we all had ended up with day glow orange suits and that by 1979 and they all got washed at the pit. So there's an old story, again, the social history of washing these pit clothes. And, uh, and the, and, but anyway, J John Lawrence was the tailor for Barber Walker Company. So the pre-mechanised uh, system, uh, I mentioned Arthur Lawrence being a butty. 
the, the coal face was what you call a long wall system by that time. So it was a long face and it was split into sections called stalls. And each stall was then a miner had to do his section of that stall, which was a stint. And that's where the term comes from, you've done your stint, right? So a, a, a butty would be in charge of that stall for getting coal out of that and he would actually contract with the company to employ colliers and he was in that to get that coal out. And that's how it operated on a subcontract system. Uh, so the first process they have to do, like this is one of the Reverend Cobb photos, was hand holding, and you had to undercut the coal, sprag it up, and then what they used to do then, once they'd spragged it under the cup, the old seam in the store, they would thrash wedges into the coal at the side and hope to bring it down in great big massive lumps. And then it went out in the tubs by pit ponies, and they used to mark on it which stall it was from. And then they used to check it on the pit top to make sure there was no dirt and that in it. So this was all the subcontract system, uh, so many stalls, Arthur Lawrence would be in charge with somebody else. So he actually subcontracted with a Barber Walker company to get the coal out and basically dealt with all the industrial relations, what we were to become in that. So again, uh, the butty system I'll mention in a bit. We're going to touch on Arthur Lawrence just, just in a bit. Uh, and uh, the Reverend Cobb was the rector at Eastwood from 1907 to 1917. He was a photographer. Uh, and all his, luckily, um, the, the slides he took, he took them for a magic lantern show, uh, which was called From the Pit to the Fireplace. And this magic lantern show was showed again uh, around Edwardian times, and he took his photographs all around that mining community of Eastwood, particularly around the time Sons and Lovers were being uh, written by Lawrence. So again, he went down the pit, at Brinsley Pit, and some of the other primitive shonky pits, what we're still going, and took photographs of the community around here. And uh, this is one where you can see again somebody hand in there. That's the screens where what they call back picking. And then gang in there with pit ponies, and then waiting at the pit top. So we have, these, these has actually formed a case study, uh, which we've done on a pilot project last year at Trent University, which was for this book here. Minecraft, the prequel, the photographic story of East Midlands Coal. So if you go, um, go to see the uh, uh, photo exhibition at the museum, these are the books hot off the press and they've got them some there. So if you pop into the museum when it's open, and one of the case studies in that is the Reverend Cobb photos taken at Brinsley uh, around 1913, sort of 1912, 1913. Right. Right, so Alan Beals was NACOD secretary, that's the union officials for Overman and Deputies at uh, Gedlin, and his little, since he retired about 30 odd years ago, his little baby has been tracing the fatalities in the Knox Coalfield out of reports in the newspapers, and he's got them on a database, it's on a website called Ely Aero. And there's also the, on there, there's a, a, a quite in-depth history of Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire and Derbyshire coalfield by Robert Bradley, who was a senior surveyor, retired, who got his honorary doctorate from Nottingham three years ago for the work he'd done. But this is the work there, and you can see the second one down there is the record for James Lawrence, which is the story I was telling you about. He got killed at Brinsley, this was Lawrence's uncle, and he got killed in 1880 by a fall of roof. Uh, and this form, formed the story for the old Chrysanthemums, which was dramatised as the widowhood of Mrs. Oldroyd. And you see the other two there, uh, if you look at the fourth one down and fifth one down, that was the explosion they had at Brinsley in 1883, which killed the deputy uh, and uh, the ostler. And also 14 pit ponies perished in that explosion. Right, so this is the old Chrysanthemums, and again, I'm, I'm not going too much into that, because Malcolm's doing that, uh, we're showing the film later tonight, the Channel 4 film that was done in the 1990s, uh, and as I remember, I think Zoe Wanamaker's plays Mrs. Bates in it, as I, as I remember, um, and that's where they still did that, so Mrs. Oldroy, the Mint Theatre Company, uh, is in New York, and what's happened over the last 20 years, uh, occasionally these, the, the director and some of the actors come over to Eastwood and we sit down, they go around the museum and the breach house 
and we have to sit down and read parts of the script in local dialect for them. And they take that back. So my actual, my elusive tones has actually made Broadway on New York like. Now, whether they understood any on it, I have no idea. But they take these back and we have to, tell, we have to talk to them, of course, about mining terminology and local accents because without that, you not understand what's going off with bits of the, you know, they're talking about mining things. So particularly, I remember nine years ago, they did uh, the daughter-in-law at the Crucible at Sheffield. And uh, the director came down and the late Linda Barron played Mrs. Gascoigne. Uh, when, uh, you, know, you know, Linda Barron was Nurse Gladys in open all hours. Uh, and I was telling her about, you know, about these pit women, how they used to do. Kath lovely describes them in, in her story, The Merry Wives of Greenwood. About these, uh, these pit women that used to be in, gra in groups on corner, you know, with curlers in the air and pom-poms on and the arms folded. You know, you know um, what's the name? Les Dawson used to take it off, didn't he? You remember he used to, used to take them off where they could all lip read and that. The, the, yeah, you know, all that sort of stuff. Well, I was telling her when uh, they did the daughter-in-law, I was explaining how she had to act this character. And, and she loved it. And she played it. We went to see the, the acting of it. She played it brilliant, absolutely fantastic. You know, she got it off to a T about these, you know. They used to, uh, one of my mates used to call them the Newstead Mafioso. Down on corner of Newstead Village there. But that, that's the programme, one they did at the Mint Theatre. And they, they did one of Lawrence's uh, plays there on Broadway. Um, I can't remember, the Collier's Friday night. One of them earlier this year, Andrew, they did in March this year. So occasionally, the Lawrence mining plays keep cropping up in America by the Mint Theatre Company. Because as you know, there, there was, um, trying to think of it now, there was Daughter-in-Law, Collier's Friday night, uh, Touch and Go. And what's the other one, Andrew? I've missed one, haven't I? There's four, there's f yeah, yeah, there's four plays, four mining plays. So that's Vine Cottage, again, so that's where it became the setting for Oldrick Chrysanthemums, or Aunt Polly's as they call it, where uh, it was the setting for the fatality in, in the Oldrick Chrysanthemums, and say, Malcolm will talk about that tonight. And that's when it were about 2009. You can't, you can't actually see it now because all the trees has grown and that. If you go up there, it's... it's it, it's not, not good at all, but uh, that, that's when you could still clearly see the cottage there. And, uh, of course, at Brinsley, Sons and Lovers were filmed there in 1960. Uh, and Dean Stockwell died last September, I don't know if you know, he was 85. He played Paul Morell in the film. Trevor Howard, of course, played the old man, as you remember. And what, what they did, um, it'll be 12 years ago now, the Eastwood and Kimberley ad uh, contacted people on the 50th anniversary for local people in the town what were props in the film. So a lot of people came forward that were elderly then, said, oh yes, I played so-and-so, and I played so-and-so. And all these Eastwood people played props in the 1960 film of Sons and Lovers. Uh, and if we can, Ben, I'll flick this next one. There's a, there's a trailer now on YouTube, which hopefully we'll be able to play. Move back one thing, will it, will it play at that centre thing? No, gone off. Got it, you nearly got it, we ain't got the film, Ben. So yeah, 1960, he, um, they filmed, like I say, a lot of local Eastwood people formed the props for the pit setting, as you know, when Sons and Lovers and they had the disaster at the start there. And, uh, and that's when the, um, the, the, these local people were recalling what parts they played 50 years later in 2010 for the Eastwood and Kimberley ad and that. Are we, uh, are we any headway with it? That's it. Press the red thing in the middle, uh, Ben. It should should play. This is a story about love, yet it is not just a love story. If you could 
help me. Teach me not to be ashamed. Although it reveals the secrets of a young man's desires, it also tells of a mother's special relationship with her son and of the women who come between them. Mother, why don't you like her? Oh, I've tried, Paul. I, I feel she wants to shut me out. From the frank and undying pages of Sons and Lovers, written by the author who gave you that other controversial world bestseller, Lady Chatterley's Lover, a screen masterpiece has emerged. You will watch with fascination as character after character comes to life to release a torrent of emotions. No right to set your sons against their father. When a man tries hard for his family, he wants a bit of respect, a bit of gratitude. Trevor Howard, famous for so many compelling performances. Dean Stockwell, who was applauded so loudly in compulsion. Why do you walk so quickly? You'll catch up with me if you're interested. Are you, Mr. Morell? Mary Ure, the Broadway stage and screen sensation. I'm warning you, Morell. Keep away from my wife. Heather Sears, so outstanding in Room at the Top. What have they been saying at home? It's not that. Your mother never liked me. She was always against it's me. It's not that. Isn't it? You wait and see. You wait till you meet someone you might love, want to marry. I don't think I'll ever marry. Not well, she... She what? Wendy Hiller, the brilliant Academy Award-winning star of Separate Tables. <laughs> Sons and Lovers, the first experiences of a young man in the mysteries of woman. Yeah, so if you, you, you go and check in um, the records they've got at Eastwood Library for the Eastwood and Kimberley, you'll see in 2010 you can pick the bits up off the market fills where people were giving the memories of, uh, of being in that film and the props, the bit you saw particularly uh, when they were running to the pit. Right, I mentioned the butty system. So, you know, I mean, this was a subcontract system, Arthur Lawrence being a butty. And um, this, is, this is a picture, again, one of the Reverend Cobb collections, which we think's down at Digby with a butty. It's a stage photo with a butty paying out. So the man in the middle there, the, the one, the third from the left, is the butty. And this is a team which would be about right, about six people that worked in the store. Although, um, when I did look at this one, obviously, it's stage photo, because there's no way I would say a butty would show them exactly the proper figures, what he'd actually earned and that. And this is the whole thing about the butty system now. Um, uh, to, the, to the extent, I'll, um, here's Lo Arthur Lawrence. And these were some um, little tins they used to pay out miners in. They used to be at Durban House Heritage Centre. And that's where an old saying comes in, money's in tin youth. So when, they, when you've do it, you read it, Jim, aren't you? I think, yeah, well, but I would say, it, it, this, this same with money's in tin, and they're like, a, you know, the very small cans of beans, what they used to do for, for a single person and that, them sort of very small tins. And uh, where they've gone to, I don't know, but um, I, I was, <coughs> I never satisfactorily or happily looked at the descriptions I've read, and this is not, I'm not being detrimental to anybody, any, any people here, uh, I'm never set happily about that situation, about the butty system in Arthur Lawrence, <coughs> to the extent where I've now put a paper, or I'm just finishing off and putting a paper together, which hopefully Sue Reed will put in the journal, which will look at it from a more mining point of view about, about the butty system and how they operated and that. And uh, it had a special interest for me, because, um <coughs> pardon me, Isaiah Wrigley, you can see there on the left, was my great-great-grandfather. And he was a butty at Portland Collieries in the 1860s, 1870s. And, of course, as you know, family history, some of it passes down. You know, all history, you've got, you can research so much, but some of it passes down. <coughs> and um, certain things my, dad, my late dad told me, uh, my dad were an overman at the... And he said, he, he, uh, at the end of the day, Isaiah Wrigley had never considered himself working class. And which had fit in with the butty for me. Because, and, and again, we found evidence where even after his death in 1924, he owned virtually six houses on a row in Eastwood. 
in Solston, sorry. So again, this, this, I will never happily, I mean, if you look, for example, at, uh, that you could put the Lawrences, if you like, upper working class or lower middle class. And that's something to do with the mum, obviously, but it's also to do with the dad. Uh, and the, the issue about your, your butty where you, you've got favourable, you can get an end house at the breach, and the issue where Lawrence got a brand new bike. Even in the time I was being brought up in a pit committee, nobody had a new bike. You built one from scratch, and it had nails holding you know, things on. So when Lawrence had one, it's telling you there's some money somewhere. So this, this whole issue about butties, and I thought in the end I need to do a paper, so that paper at momently I've been... Uh, interviewing some elderly miners and that, say, you know, trying to re-examine this butty system. And, you know, I mean, obviously, I don't want to get into that issue about the class issue, because that opens the right can of worms itself. But more about the butty system's not really been favourably recorded, because mostly it's been the left, the, the, the left wing that's got hold of it has been the corrupt system, which is not totally all the answer. Um, so, so, again, hopefully, this, uh, once I've finished this, I've got little bits to add to this article. Sue will put that in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, D.H. Lawrence Journal or one of the future ones. And, and that will add more little bits to it, if, uh, of, uh, not just academic-wise, but from a mining background, looking at that. And again, this is an issue what's why we've still got them direct links with myself and people, that generation with pits, what we need to be putting down. This is what we need to be recording because these histories are passed down through mining families. So you know about things, you know, and we discussed strike pay last night. And, you know, I mean, I, I could identify with strike pay, the short story, the aspects of it and everything. So, you know, again, to me, when if someone has been brought up in that mining community and you can actually re relate to what Lawrence is writing, well, he's, you know, he's obviously been observant and shown what's going on. <coughs> So there, so that's our family line. So you can see Isaiah Wrigley on second line down. And if you follow that through, bottom left-hand corner, there's not many left on that now. There's just, uh, on the second line, my Uncle Rex died uh, about a month ago. Uh, there's just, there's a Keeling family line, there's a Wrigley family line. So Jeff is 84, and then there's just the two bottom, me and my cousin, that went to pit. So you've got, you know, obviously you've got a 200-year line there, right from Samuel Wrigley right down to, to coal mining. So when, when they chop these veins up in there, when it says coal in the blood, it means what it says. And this is, uh, Ron Story did this in the, uh, the, the uh, sorry, 1985 when the centenary of Lawrence's uh, birth and they had the big events around Eastwood and that. Ironically, that's when... Uh, the last pit shut that year, and Ron, Ron Story, who was a, a mining historian and a museum academic, the, the museum, the Brinsley Headstocks, went to a museum near Loundall, up at Retford, and then came back to Eastwood, while Ron was the curator, along with Alan Griffin, who was the academic, at that museum. And he did a, 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 a wonderful book, it's called Aspects of Brinsley Colliery and the Lawrence Connection, and that was published in 1985. And this is a account, he wrote an actual account of what he thought would be a day in the life of Arthur Lawrence in that book. And that's the other one, that's uh, Barry Johnson did this, Barry's, Barry's dead and gone now. But that's uh, the Nottinghamshire Derbyshire Labour History, he, he did an account of the butty system uh, in that. That's very much uh, the responding view from that, that's a left wing because Barry was a communist. So you've got them two contrasting views of, of what Ron, Ron Story did of being a, a butty and what uh, Barry Johnson did. So anyway, winding up on the heritage bit then, so we'll bring sort of things up. Uh, like I say, food for thought, we 40 years we're approaching from the last Eastwood pit. Um, that's the picture at the top looking from Lincroft over towards the pit and on the left there's the workshops. This is the mural, what's down at the side of Court and, Enge Court and Engineering now. That was uh, one of the last shift at Moor Green, or Moor Grain as they call it. The local saying in local dialect, what's grainer than grain, more grain. So that's how the saying was. So that's uh, then that finished. And again, this plate was done, again, to coincide with Lawrence's birth, uh, the centenary of his birth and the last bit going. So that's, uh, these, pits were, these plates were done in 1985. Now this, this is the plan here, 
for the redevelopment, the, the top bit you can see in the top right hand corner is the Lincroft school site. Uh, and this is the other bit, but the important bit in the bottom there, that, gr that black bit is the Eastwood Hub. So apparently this redevelopment, they were asking for submissions last year. I've not, I don't know if any of you have, I've not heard a thing. Uh, I submitted to them about this Eastwood Hub that we do need a community place that can sit 60 people and need a uh, place to mount the two Nottinghamshire area banners in it and various things and that and incorporate the breach arse into that because the breach arse is just below the bit there. So it's a logical thing to do. Not heard anything whatsoever from these submissions and that was February 21. So what's going off with that, I don't know. Um, of course, the, that, that old bit is in the middle of the Blue Line Trail. Um, tomorrow, of course, we're doing the, the trial of the uh, app we're doing there, the, the digital route at Brinsley Headstocks. And hopefully, eventually, we'll lead back onto this and digitalise that so we can actually go around on a mobile device around the Blue Line Trail and hear stories and uh, relate to Lawrence and the local folklore, the literature and all that as you go around. So you'll, you'll be able to hear my elusive tones without me being there, if you can stand it. So, I mean, I mean very much now the Blue Line Trails very much died a death. I mean, we first appeared in Eastwood, living about 25 years ago, and significantly there was Japanese and Chinese students still going around then. You, you've not seen that for a long time now. Okay, you know, so it's... Uh, Again, you've got to move into that. Certainly one thing you've got to do is move into that digital area to, to capture the, the chunky bits of that. So, uh, yeah, that's another thing. But, yeah, so there's the Eastwood Hub, the library area. Um, there's the Durban House Initiative I mentioned. The Breach House, of course, is a question mark over that, about ownership. Ken Roberts died uh, last year. who was the owner of it, and it's still going through the motions about who actually owned the breach house. It was set up by him and a chap called Doug Sass, who were academics in the United States in the 60s. And Doug Sass uh, is possibly still alive, living in Florida. And uh, they set it up under, the, un, under a title then of the, the well, they, they actually there was academics in Canada and the States. Uh, so they set it up of the Young Writers Association of Canada, what actually took over the breach house. This was in the early 70s. Um, so what, that's another thing. Uh, there's the issue of Gavin Gillespie about the statue. Again, I mean, if we incorporate in that, really with Lawrence, you need to incorporate that coal mining heritage into it as well. That incorporates sons and lovers and the plays and everything. So you could have a mining family in Lawrence or something. So not just a Lawrence itself, you need to incorporate the heritage of it. Uh, Leveling up, question mark. There's a bid gone in for Eastwood. I don't know what it includes in that. Obviously one for Ashfield as well, so that's another issue. And then the digital initiatives, obviously we do in the first bit of that tomorrow when we do the Brinsley Headstocks one to bring that so we can actually walk and, and, and digitally. So this bit's there. I mean, that's the week we've gone to. So they're the old leaflets, what they still give out. And then we're going to go to that sort of thing. That's a bit of the, uh, the, the stills what come off the Brinsley Trail we're doing, the digital trail. So there's Paul on that. We did the recce last week on that, going around, looking at it. And then we've got to get through to them. Because that's the idea of the game. It's passing the baton to the next generation. And uh, amazingly, uh, when Paige, my daughter, um, be about 10 years ago, she was still at Eastwood School. And I'll give you a bit of food for thought here. She was picking the GCSEs. So I says, she ended up, she's just done a law degree. She didn't. She didn't do history. In her own words, she said, I don't want to enter Posada like my dad. So she didn't do history. But we went in to have a look at history, uh, the GCSE syllabus. This is 10 years ago. And they did an in-depth study, an independent study, and you do a local history study. Right. The local history study 10 years ago at Hall Park, or whatever it was called then, was Warwick Castle. And I come out in absolute disbelief. I said, you know, I said to this young teacher, I said, do you know what's under your nose? I said, you've got more history under your nose here than you want, and you're going to Warwick Castle. I said, I cannot believe it. So that's what you're up against sometimes. But anyway, it's, getting, it's passing that over to that. To that. Uh, that's our Mining Heritage website. So if you go on that, there's, there's heaps of stuff we've got on there. We'll probably be rejigging that next year. Uh, and they mark contact details. So well, that's, uh, that's when I got tangoed on left, and that's when I joined Ken Dodge Diddy Men. 
Uh, and that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was fantastic, as we expected. Um, brilliant. So much information and wonderful humour and absolutely everything. Now, it's over to you to uh, fire questions at David. And he's going to sit there next to that microphone, and I'm using I the portable. Have to come down and hear what you've said because no, he's. Uh, I'm, uh, you're right, I'm going to take the mic down to them. Yeah. David, uh, the first thing that go on old miners is immediately the hearing. <laughs> Although our Mr. Trenton's have had selective hearing for at least 30 years. <laughs> so, right. Uh, I've got a few notices I want to give at the end of this meeting about what's happening at the end of the week. But over to questions. Um, so, at the beginning of Sons and Lovers, Lawrence obviously gives various information about the mining industry. And one of the things he says is that um, if a butty was given a, a good seam of coal to mine, they could bring out a hundred or two tons of coal. And he said, I mean, it seems to me there's a huge difference from a miner's perspective between a hundred tons and two hundred tons. And of course, it, it leads me to question just how much Lawrence knew about the particularities of coal. I mean, he's being asked to write about mining and his own background as a major selling point as a young writer. Did he actually go underground? I, I don't think he did, but it, it, it'd, be, it'd be a way to a certain extent about the talk, what his dad be talking in us. And bear, bear in mind, the, the butties at times will probably pay out. I mean, a bit in Sons and Lovers where they pay out mm. in the house. I mean, yeah. the bits of our shows are on the street, but some of them will pay. I mean, some used to pay out in pubs because mm. that's where the old, the old, I don't, do, do you know the old um, culture of ale on the slate? Mm. They don't mean like actually on the slate, it means ale on tick. The Republic sells them, what Gaffigal's do, used to still do it at Jockey. And I, I, I always refused, because I also said to that thing, I said, if I ain't got that money to come into this pub for a pint, I'm not coming in no more. I'm not, there's no ale going on on tick. But that, that they did that deliberately, the butties, obviously, to get the money back off the colliers. So, but it, I mean, Lawrence wouldn't have gone underground. Yeah. Yeah. Horse awesome and Jockey, they used to do ale on sleep. Well, it was a modern version of it. They did, Kath. It was it like a, a card, what they did. Yeah. But, um, but what, what they did, of course, was, was put that so when they pay so much like and then take the price off of the ale. This was still in the 1980s. And possibly in the 1990s, to be honest. I, I heard of it. There was no tradition what carried on. But yeah. they, if you trace that back, the butties traditionally used to get them to pay in pub because the idea was to get the money, done a deal with landlord and get the money off them. This is yeah. where the old story, Andrew, about, you know, the story of Eldrick Sampton is where she thinks he's gone to a pub. You know, and he's actually been killed, that fit in that. But, I mean, Lawrence wouldn't have gone away that, but I think he would have been away to a certain extent about his dad talking and get some idea about that system working on that stores. Man, the Reverend Cobb would have witnessed it. With his folk. When he went down the pit in that, he would have witnessed working on stores in that and, and that team of men. Of course, bear in mind, the length of your stint what you did in your stores depended on your seam thickness. So, yeah, you know, I mean, but you're talking top hard, probably four foot at, at, at Brinsley, and you'd have so much, so many, th you'd have a stint of so many yards. They'd hand hole it first, and then they'd get the coal down, take it out, and then, uh, you know, he'd do, I mean, uh, the, the, the thing I mentioned about Butties, about Lawrence, his dad, he'd got to have a business ethic. Because he'd, he'd got to be able to negotiate with the company understand the business ethic of the coal he was getting out and what his cut were going to be. And this is what en I've never entirely been satisfactory. I mean, in most accounts, they call him a miner, which he would have been. He would have applied his trade as a miner, but certainly by 1975, on marriage certificate, he's a butty. And he, he, would, he would conform to what a butty did, which was a middleman making your money and taking your cut. often described as a mining contractor. Yeah, yeah well, that's it. That, is that the better that's way that's of describing it? That's the first word for it. The butty is it. Mining contractor is, is the butty is the local word. I mean, the, the butty system, uh, it virtually died out. The, the bulls of a company bought it back in the 1920s and 30s, but as you got in the lead up to the World War II, 
it died out basically because you, you've basically not, not got time for little petty, well, not argue, arguments between butchers and teams of men. I mean, m most people in mining history, labor and trade union history, they remember the big strikes. But the reality of the situation was disputes between butchers and teams of men. Rag arts, they call them in Yorkshire, where you, you, you know, there'd be a dispute over the contract and that, and then they'd have to solve that dispute pretty quick and go back to work. So, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I was just pursuing that then. I lived in North Wales for a time, and they, of course, had what they called the big butty system. Yeah. Uh, which b was eventually, I think, banned, so that just one man contracted out the whole pit. So, but in this little butty system, did, did not the butty also work as well? Wouldn't he have? Uh, wouldn't oh, yeah, it worked. It worked there. It do so much. But yeah. you've, you've got to remember, he took the responsibility on of it, Jim, of getting that coal out and organising it. And that's yeah. where he took his coal. Right. So what we've described in this article I'm doing, I sat with Bob Bradley and I says, right, describe to me in your old words what a butty do. He says, right, David, uh, there's a block of coal in this for this shift and it's 21 quid. And he gets that 21 quid out, so he's got six men. First thing he does, he's got his share because he's doing a bit with him and that like, but he'll take two pound or three pound out on it before he starts and then divide the 18 quid up with six, including him. So he's yeah. got his three already, what he's took out, and then three in this year. The other men know that he's robbing him, probably, or doing that, but he thinks he's got that extra for organising it and doing the bartering. But, uh, but just to mention, Jim, the big butty and the little butty system. Right, the big butty system, Isaiah Wrigley, my great-great-grandfather, was a big butty. He operated the Portland number one pit, the old shebang. 80 men and boys like a small medium enterprise, what you can operate. By the time, when I mentioned to you, your more greens and your bigger pits is coming on, that system couldn't operate because the system was too big. So it evolved into what they call a little butty system, which was the, s the coal face split up into sections called stalls. And that was the economic and produ producing part of the coal system as they operated it. So it, it evolved, the little sy butty system evolved out of the big butty one. Um, Terrific lecture, I enjoyed it very much. Um, did the butties and the miners have different unions? Um, did they have what, sorry? Did they have different unions? Uh, well, the, the butties, certainly if you look back into religion, I mean, a, a, a prominent communist that wrote a book that we fell out big time about nine years ago, um, he wrote a book called Look Back in Anger, Harry Patterson, so we, we was in discussion once before we fell out big time. And I said to Harry, I says, the roots of Nottinghamshire mining has got more to do with messages than Marxism. And, and I said, you need to trace it back because all the early trade union leaders were in Methodist chapels. And that's how they learnt the oratory skills to talk. But so certainly in terms, not so much trade unions, but the congregational church, what Alan's been talking about and the wonderful picture what Malcolm's done, was often known as the butties lump. That's right, yeah. Because all the butties went there. The primitive Methodists was where the men would go. Yeah. And and not particularly, butties wouldn't be uh, particularly unionised people. They, yeah. they, they, the men unionised and the, the Nottinghamshire Miners Association was formed in 1881. And that was a federal system. So again, by 1889, the Miners Federation of Great Britain were formed, but the different unions was area based. Yeah. And, and right through, right through to the 1984 dispute, what broke it, you had this continual argument about how much say and clout an area had and how much the national had. Mm -hmm. And that come under no uncertain terms to a bang in 1984. Because when they come in saying, you'll do this from Sheffield, whoa, 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 don't, that don't work like this round here, we don't do it like that. Could and, you that's got it, and that's got a history to it. Could you just say a word about free coal? <laughs> So, so the butties weren't so much unionised, they because they obviously they'd be negotiating with the company, but the men became unionised, yeah. and say from 1881 onwards, and then you've got the little matter again in Eastwood, where you had the split in 1926 with the Spencer Union. So I mean, jokingly, as we get in in the, this lead up to the 40th anniversary of the 84 strike and the controversy of Nottinghamshire, which which is still playing out. I got asked 
couple of months ago about you know what what do you think the outcome what's going to go off with this i says i haven't got a clue mate it says because the jury's still out for 1926 we haven't decided on that yet they're more 1984. But could you just say a word about freed coal? It's, it's very striking, isn't it, in the Lawrence writings? Uh, 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 say a word about what, sorry? Free coal. Free? Not free, free. Free coal? Oh, mm. right, well, free coal was a, it was a, a, along with your tied house and that, you got concessionary fuel. So you got a part of your, part of your employment rights was you got so much coal. I mean, when I was on ordinary coal, it was 10 ton. And then it got down as it went to smokeless. I think it were, would it be two and a half, Anthony? something like that because obviously you got the glass fronted part leads but that, that was right back to Lawrence's day in the free coal that they got obviously for the rate because interestingly when you had the strikes particularly 1912 21 26 that's why they did massive outcropping round here which was uh, it was organized outcropping actually by some union men but they needed this even though it was poor quality coal they needed the coal to keep the range going because if, if you can't keep the range going you can't cook nothing so, yeah, so it's got a long history, that concessionary coal. And, of course, the, old, the, the, the laugh you'll see about it, going back to social history, one of the things older people will tell you is they got the coal man when the coal came to make sure they counted him, to make sure they weren't being diddled. I think we've got uh, a couple of questions over here. I just wanted to add something. When you were referring to the various chapels and you referred to the primitive Methodist, which was the... The workers one. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence actually mentions that in quite detail in yeah. strike pay. The beginning yeah, well, it's of that. at the start of strike pay. Yeah, they, they pay out of the primitive Methodist exactly, chapel. Exactly, and he's, he describes all that so yeah. vividly. Yeah. Yeah, I want to continue with this booty discussion, David. I mean, I don't know whether Lawrence's dad was educated, but I would think the butties were good at communicating with management um, and if you think about it it's also security for the men if you could get a job with a butty team you got a, and you worked hard which suited the management yeah you got a job for life basically haven't you you got security if you were idle I'm afraid you know off you go boy and that really was um, it was it was a theme right through the mining industry when I, when I mean I started in '63, and right up to the end, if you weren't favourable within an overman, you didn't get any uh, weekend work. Yep. And and I've had lads who my fitters, who a team would come to me and say, I don't want him when we go to so and so place, I don't want him, I want so and so. You know, and we'd have to negotiate sometimes with what fitter went to what face and so on and so because of A, they were in the team, they could talk the lingo, if you like, of that team, but they were hard working lads and it was a matter of if your fitter could keep that face going, you'd make a lot more money on contract. Yep. So the butty system really is, is, has been right through, not just for... Well, yeah, yeah, the coal, principle it, of it. The it principle of it is, is well basically... It's still team, there, team when work. we worked, Jim, there. It's still yeah. around. We yeah. had, they had our contracts you were and talking about. And the other men, I mean, yeah. they were favourites for the under-manager, and obviously they did quite well out of, of, of uh, the so-called butty system, didn't they? Yeah. yeah the, the, the principle, I mean, it, I saw it again in private industry when it went back private in the 90s. Basically, and Anthony certainly would have done, and you would have done, Jim. Mm. Uh, where these contract parts of the pit came in and basically it was a butty what were in pit yard and they were, they were the turnover of men they were employing were phenomenal because mm. at that time I finished off working at lamp cabin and you could see the lamps that were actually dusty and that you'd rate, and then it would be there for two shifts sacked and then somebody else would come in and this pool of money because they were trying to get the people because obviously it were on a sliding scale and the, the more it went over a certain date and that they were losing money so you got mm. to get the job done and that's the principle of, of what the butties operated to. And then towards the end, we finished up with a contract system for yeah, every yeah. job that was done in the pit. No, these were the contractors, I'm saying. It was exactly. The, it would say exactly like you know, Jim, you've done them. You've yeah. got your team of men, the fitters, mm. so many men to get coal out, but they'd have to get the right mindset of people to make sure that contract was done in the least time so they could get it money. So, uh, you know, and, that, and that's, that's the incentive. Uh, I mean, this, is, this underpins the argument of the, the 84 dispute. 
one of the issues about how much incentive broke the unity at NUM and that, but of course I say to them, well, you can negotiate a contract down, which for my job as union secretary. So if you're doing your job proper, you can say, well, hold on. I says, look, these, this problem here with that, like that, you negotiate the norm down and get them the money. Yeah. You've seen it done. Yeah, I've done it. I'll admit to it. Yeah. So if you're doing your job proper, but if you're ideologically opposed to that, because of your trade union principles and that, you ain't going to do it. So I understand what you, that principle and that and what you need to do. But if you lived, if you lived in New Street, you couldn't get a job in New Street, for example, no. unless you went to Saxby. But you were good at cricket. Your dad was at Saxby. And, you, you know, it was a bit difficult. So you could have got your job, but you could cook. And so were houses. If you couldn't get a house in New Street Village, I mean, I'd have loved to know more about the principles of trust funds or whatever the cricket club is. Where I live, the first thing you need to do is, is the old boys, you know, you could be impressed with them, of course. And then eventually, if you're all right, if your dad managed to do it to get into the new village up New Street. Yeah, so which were more modern houses. Yeah, yeah. yeah but the, the um, yeah, I mean, the, the, old, the old issue about uh, contracts and that, like I say, because I, um, I mean, very much now, it depends not so much the winners that write the history, but who writes the history. And of course, a lot of the coal history, we'll read it, Jim Diamond knows this, he's read lots of it. He's, I mean, Jim borrowed be a wonderful book about that one, Jim, about 1906 to 1914, about the trade union and about, but most of it's been written with a left-wing bias to it and not reality of what you've just described, Jim, mm. about that work ethic and that. So this is your class you've got writing, this post-coal era of writing this history. Yeah. yeah, nothing to do about Butters and stuff. Uh, we've been mining coal in Eastwood's got 700 years of rich coal mining history. You go around over old coal fields, even like Upner, which is me, they've all got mining statues. Eastwood had got nothing. You wouldn't even think nope. it was a mining town. Yet we've got 700 years of yep. coal mining from monks and etc. We've got nothing. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that was that food for thought, that list I put up there, Anthony, about, you know, the, the Lawrence statue, I've got no issue, because statues bring your tourism in. I tell you that, the, the Morecambe one, Eric Morecambe one, did when my dad lived at Morecambe. So you'll put a statue there and you'll get people. But I think it needs to incorporate that mining heritage as, and as well, because we are that. That underpins all, I mean, we've got a world-famous author now, that his roots are all on coal mining. He wrote plays, short stories, novels and that. I mean, yeah, you've got so many through Colford, obviously, you know, we've got in, in South Wales and some in North East, but there's certainly these stories in literature and in the culture of it. And, and you have to encompass that, because that's, that's part of the story. I mean, the latest story, as I tell them now, is, is, a, is a black to green story. We move from black to green. But that, that whole story, I incorporate it, but, you know, you can, that ends, that, that chairman made, Anthony, the, the spirit alone. 700 years, all the history of mining, the culture of it, the primitive Methodist chapels, all the non-conformist chapels, all, it all plays a role. Right, we, we're going to move on. There are still quite a few people. Can I just ask everyone, if you want to speak, just put your hand up and we, we must use the microphone, otherwise it can't and, uh, and by the way, Alan, I'm gasping for a cup of tea, I don't mind anybody I else. I think, we, would you like to wind up, sort of? Uh, no, no, get whoever yeah. wants to ask a question, and okay. then we'll, because we're, we will be going next door for a cup of tea. Oh, before yes, we're going to end up with that. So, shall we have another five minutes? Yes, yes, we want, yeah. But try and keep it yeah. short, everybody, so that everybody can have. Who'd like to speak? Yes. I didn't know you wanted to have a question. But just, just raise your hand, please, because I, I just know where I can find that. So, uh, Rolf first, then you, and then <coughs> anybody else, so I don't miss anybody else. Right. Well, we've got to be quite brief then. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Well, very quickly, you said that uh, the coal industry was nationalised in 1937. Forty-seven. 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 Sorry. Um, why did that happen, and who was in government at that uh, time? It was the Attlee government. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, that the Attlee government basically uh, enacted big nationalisations in railways 1948, coal 1947. It was a long sought after from the miners' union going right back before World War One. 
the Sankey Commission, 1919, the, the, the recommended nationalisation. It never came into being. Uh, and then, of course, that's being debated now, particularly about whether the role of nationalisation was a success or it wasn't a success. And, and, and of course, there's conflicting accounts of that. Um, certainly, if you, if you talk to ex-colliery managers from the time or read accounts of that, they say that their role as a manager significantly diminished with nationalisation. And he could run a pit, going back to what Jim were on about, he could run his pit as he seemed fit. Um, but yeah, na nationalisation, I mean, obviously it lasted just short of 50 years, till 1994. Uh, didn't particularly solve the problems at coal industry because it's about dealing with a diminishing industry and deindustrialisation. I mean, if you compare, interestingly, Germany, what happened there and what happened in Britain, you had all this issue about, you know, but, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's it, again, the jury's still out on that one. Yes, two quick points. Um, when Durban House was first done up by a councilman, Milan Reludovic, uh, and some money from Europe, uh, it was explicitly a heritage centre, which meant it did not have accession to exhibits. There were things on display which were accession to exhibits, but they were yeah. the accession to exhibits of Nottingham City Museums. Yeah. So that may explain where those uh, snap tins, uh, not snap tins, pay tins went. Uh, the other thing is that now uh, Durban House is coming back into public use. I haven't quite got to the bottom of this. It's something to do with dementia, and it's something to do with men in sheds. In other words, it's sort of old people's welfare, if you like. Yeah. Whether that will any involve any historical or museum no Function. idea. I okay. don't know. I, I, Paul, I'm can not. I, I'm not particularly can I come been in involved here with it. So uh, basically, because of a time issue and that, so yeah. I, I don't really know. Some of the exhibits you're on about, yeah. they belong to Nottingham. You know, the Purdy lamp and that. They obviously went back. The other stuff that wasn't attached went to Bill Thorpe. Yeah. 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 I, I'd like to just come in on the second one because this is quite a sensitive issue. Um, Durban House is coming back, and it's going to be a place of the community. Uh, I'll stand at the front so I can see you. It's going to be a place of the community, so all, all types of uh, societies and organisations. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful, and there's been a, a, a group of people who've worked very, very hard from this community, and I, I, I was privileged to be shown the inside of Durban House a few weeks ago, and it's just wonderful, and to think that will come back into use. And we'll be able to use it, of course, for future festivals, the Age Joint Society. Um, but there's lots of other groups as well. And it's, it's great, great news. But we have to be very sensitive because there have been lots of issues that have to be worked through. OK. Thank yeah. you. It's, uh, it's not questions, but personal recollections. Um, during my time involved with the advertiser, uh, this was at the time when the Japanese used to visit, and I got to know Professor Fujiwara quite well. Yep. And for a number of years, I was on his Christmas card list. But a film you haven't mentioned, Priest of Love, Christopher Miles directed, Sarah Miles, his wife, was in it. And so was my daughter. Because when they filmed the um, explosion... This was, in, this was in 81, the film. Elaine was at Hall Park School then, so oh yes. Yeah, yeah so it, it would have been. And she was in the, the, the scene where they're all dashing across to oh the right, headstock. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she also got a second day of filming. So she, she had two days of filming for that film. And we got invited to the Odeon Cinema in Nottingham for the launch of the film. My daughters couldn't go because it was an X-rated film. So, and they were not old enough. Uh, uh. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Interesting. I think, w do you think we should wind up now? Did, did John, did you have a question? Well, You're oh, right. I'm oh, sorry. Sing me after in there. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, there. I'll, I'll add you in there. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to, f uh, I think we're going to continue this over at tea. Several people have intimated that. So while we're still on air, 
I believe we're still on air, are we? Yeah, because we, we've got, uh, you know, probably people all over the world listening to this. We've, well, we hope so, anyway. But um, thank you so much, David. Yes, You've covered so many things, uh, and we could go on talking for, a, well, we probably will next door, but you'll get your cup of tea as well. <laughs> but I just want to say two other things about the festival. A um, very important thing, I have to say, is next Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there's our fin finale service. And David and Denise, the vicar of Greasley, um, and a number of us have worked really, really hard to put together this service, which is, um, how do you describe it? It's a memorial of all the work that the miners have done and possibly some of her families will be here won't they yes, and yes. and um, d just tell them what, what you yourself, well well there's still really the, the service is going to be on the theme of the uh, festival which is respect for the landscape and, and and the mining heritage so it's it's very much i see it as that black to green issue again uh, you know i mean in, in one lifetime to get what you've got from it, sort of industry to that green issues and everything so we reflect that and that it reflects the local landscape but uh, there's um, we're doing it through basically there'll be readings and reflective readings and, and, and some songs in between and, and, the, and Eastwood Male Boys Choir and uh, I've got my friend Terry Faulkner who's ex uh, Coley ex Pitman who's is a wonderful singer uh, one of the folk singers he's going to do uh, a rendition of Rita McNeil's A Working Man um, so, so it's very much, it's, I, I very much see it on that post coal era as a time of reflection. When you've got a bit of history, what's finished, like it has, it's time, yeah, it, it, yeah it's controversial at times, it can contested, but it is very much a time to reflect on what's past and how, how things are going now, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, and I'll be first to admit some changes has perhaps been good, you know, some all right and some not so good, but that's, that's what you do, and this is part of this festival, we'll weigh this up. So we want everybody to be there. Um, people who've taken part in the festival, of course, that's nice to bring everybody together there, but um, to remember and to celebrate. And we're talking about the sort of creativity of uh, black, what did you say, black to? Black to green. Black to green. And that's precisely what we've been remembering. Like yesterday, we did this liturgy very early in the morning at uh, Collier's Wood, which formerly was Small Green Colliery, yep, yep. and, uh, and we were very much uh, c commemorating the sort of references to nature, and uh, we walked down to Small Green Reservoir, and um, yeah, and there's more of that actually. On Thursday, uh, we're having the whole day at Greasley Church, and uh, they're opening up with, with wonderful mining artifacts from uh, Anthony, you're preparing some Hags Farm, they're going to bring some stuff, um, all sorts of really interesting events, I'm doing an organ recital there, um, so that will be in the day, and then in the evening we're going to go over to Beauvale Priory, and Rolf, who's uh, our main speaker, who's going to tell us all about the Carthusians, and what, you know, who were these people, who, in the and uh, Malcolm will obviously refer to D.H. Lawrence's short story um, and then we're going to go out actually into the ruins and actually do a medieval service which will be really lovely so there's lots to look forward to but I really want to emphasize Sunday afternoon as, as a way of bringing everybody together and remembering this fantastic history that we've got in Eastwood okay well thank you very much for coming thank you for those who've been actually watching us on the telly and um, see you at the next time Thank you very much, and thank you, David, again. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you.